Okay. Uh, I call this meeting the Independent School District to order. Let the record show that the quorum of board members are present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that the notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meeting Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. Let's have a quick prayer. Our gracious and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of coming here tonight and trying to learn things about what the legislator did. We ask for a special prayer for our teachers and for our administrators and our students as they start the new school year. Lord, guide, guard, and direct us. Help us to make decisions that are best interest of our district. These things we say in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay, we're going to push everything to the end and get right into our training. Yeah, he's in. Okay, so we'll just do that. Yeah, we'll she's reading 16s. You're going to do all the paper filing there, Bill, for us? Yes. Okay, I will. thank you. You're okay, sweet. But I got some transcripts. <laughs> okay, try that. There you go. So they can email him things to me. <laughs> do you have one of these? Okay, you got them. I got go. that and, and the sign in sheet and all kinds of stuff emailed to me today. Good. So are y'all going to stay live during the meeting? Huh? Are live? Yeah, I think we're staying live during the meeting. I'm, they're not going to be able to see. And you're saying we just need to go ahead and eat as we're going. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> so if you want to go ahead and get pizza, get pizza, guys. If you know, may have been working today. You may be hungry. Yeah, I'm starving. <laughs> Pass it on to, to Chris over there. I'll get, I'll get Bayless. He always forgets to do this. stuff about the year we're fixing to start entering. Remember, <clears throat> Zoom really took off with COVID um, and people are constantly adapting. People are getting better at doing that. We're going to continue to try to provide hybrid trainings. But if you, your district wants to take part in that, so if you as a school board member want to do virtual trainings um, or your school is wanting to do virtual trainings in for instruction, I that you need to take out the virtual learning services contract. That's the only way we're we'll able to, to get online. And hmm. take hmm. We're charging you, is what you're saying. Um, next thing, Zoom registration. I think we're getting better at it, but still, for safety issues, 
Um, security, we want to talk and make sure that we're following protocols. It's really hard on letting, when we have, like tonight, there's 98 people registered uh, for this, and it's hard for uh, two of us to, to get everybody in and know who you are, and we want to know who you are so that you won't have some kind of crazy photo bomb that happens during the, during the presentation. So the new process for Zoom registration is even if you call up here and have us register you, we can still do that. But then that's going to generate a email to you that you have to go in and put a little bit of information. And then that email, when you answer, actually sends you the Zoom link. And so that's the only way you can have that. Um, but it helps with things like, uh, so around a while ago, there was like a couple of schools that have the superintendent saying three times, and we don't know which one to let in. So um, that helps us on that end. All right, so that's all I have. So I'm going to turn it over now to Shirley Clark. She's going to discuss some things going on in accountability. Good evening. I'm Shirley Clark. I'm the Director of School Support Services here at Region 16. And we're going to just jump right in here. Are you on, Shirley? It's their side. She's going right here in the middle. Look behind her. It's the same thing as we have there. So that's what I was wondering. Will her picture show up there rather than that? Troy does this to me every time. He hands me a clicker when we're training. Every time. I'm going to have to start checking you out, Troy. I'll try. Well, give us a moment. Technical difficulties. As Dane said, we're trying to get this hybrid Zoom model all worked out where we do it seamlessly. Seamlessly? Not happening. Did the one that says share screen stop the share? Not share again. See what it says, the screen, the upper left one. Hit that. That's pretty small. Huh. <laughs> okay, let me try this. Um, won't even work on the keyboard. It still is Well, something's going across, huh? Yeah, we practiced a lot, and of course, it worked. <laughs> How did the teacher train go, James? Do what? Thank you, got it. It's going pretty good. The first day went pretty well, and everybody seemed to be kind of happy, and Today we've had training on uh, Kagan, new model, new strategy. Then when we share the screen, it won't work with the Both those presenters were really good. Oh, okay, good. Mm -hmm. yeah, probably, we didn't understand that quite last night. I probably told them to on the ground. Okay, while it's working, we're going to jump in here. It would be better. So yeah. the first bills we're going to talk about have to do with uh, IGC committees. So IGC stands for Individual Graduation Committee. And the IGCs have been in place, and that's the committee you can convene when a senior hasn't passed all their end of course exams. You can convene an IGC, work out a plan, then they can uh, complete the plan, and those students can graduate. So, because of COVID, we didn't test STAR in 2020, and uh, because of that, we have some seniors who are trying to graduate, and we have some holes with their EOCs. So House Bill 999 actually just gave us a way to convene these IGCs and help these students graduate even if there's more than two end of course exams that they're looking at. Um, you'll notice this is just because of COVID and it actually expires here in a couple of weeks on September 1st. So that's House Bill 999. Most of your schools have already done that, are doing that right right now as we speak when kids are first coming into school. The other IGC bill has to do um, with the statute becoming permanent. 
the ITCs before expired every legislative session. So it had to go back through the whole process. So what 1603 does is it just makes IGCs permanent in statute where it doesn't expire. Now what that also does is it gives the commissioner the authority to go in to investigate those districts that have a high percentage of IGC graduates. In other words, it, it puts us a measure in there where schools can't just rubber stamp and overuse it. So those are our IGC bills. Now let's look at some college career military ready information. If you recall from previous training, you know that we, in the accountability system, we measure CCMR, that's College Career Military Ready. And uh, what this has done is add some indicators to our CCMR. So House Bill 773 adds back that career, that CTE program of study option. Remember when we used to have the coherent sequence option for accountability? This adds back a program of study option. We don't yet have rules, so we don't know if it's gonna be a point or half a point or any of that yet, but we know that it's going to count in some way. House Bill 1147, uh, as you know, the military ready data was everywhere across the state and they aren't using that student intent to enlist like they used to. So what they have added is that if our students are in the Texas National Guard, that we will get to count those students for both our CCMR outcome bonus and in the accountability system. So that's good news. It gives us some other ways to meet that criteria. So now your favorite topic in mind, accountability and assessment. So let's talk first about state assessments. So House Bill 3261 just continues what they started in the last legislative session to move to online assessments. So that will happen if we continue on this timeline in the school year 22-23, where we will be doing all online assessments in school year 22-23. And also with that bill, with 3261, it is establishing a grant program that can help districts with their infrastructure and training. So expect that to happen. Accountability. This is Senate Bill 1365. You see that in the bottom left corner. So while this bill was actually there to clarify the meaning of a rating of D, it's leaving a lot of questions. So um, I'll just tell you that multiple years of a D are treated as an F. So uh, from now on, basically you want to think about a C being the threshold that you need to meet at your district to avoid any interventions. Uh, the third bullet here talks about this alternative method for evaluating performance and notice it's for 2020, 21, that's this year. And uh, as you know, we all have a not rated label. Well, this alternative method popped up in this bill and what it's going to do, this is really a good thing for those districts and, or the campuses that are eligible. If you had a D or an F, we didn't have any IRs, but if you had a D or an F, from the most recent year. That would have been 2019, the most recent accountability year. Then if you have a 95% participation rate and you meet this threshold that they're going to do with at least a C, you are acceptable and it breaks the chain of a D or an F. So it doesn't, you know, as you're in the accountability system each year, you're a D or an F, it ratchets up until eventually the commissioner can close your campus. So what this evaluation does, this alternative evaluation gives these schools that have had this rating since 2019, it gives them a way to perform and break that chain. So what they'll be looking at for performance, they will take these campuses that were D or an F, in 19, 
they will run some data measures. They're going to look at star performance and your relative performance from domain two. Average those together, and if it's a C or higher, then you earn the star and you get to break that chain of D or F performance. We're going to apply for so that that's pretty junior. cool for the people that are eligible. That? Any questions about We're that? We're going to apply for this in the junior high with the junior high because they're at a C plus. Dr. Felici. When do you think we would? That's a great question. So later in September, let's see, I have that written down here. The date that they're going to, um, early September, excuse me, Dr. Flushy, early September, they will post that in the accountability application in Teal. And then I believe you have until October to submit whatever form they put in there for these campuses to tell them, yes, you, you want to participate and use the alternative evaluation. So we'll be watching that as well, and we won't let any of our campuses miss that. So. Do we know how many All right. Do we know the last thing I have to talk about is counselor work time. Yeah. And what Senate Bill 179 does is it actually requires counselors to spend at least 80% of their time at work on actual counseling duties. So you see that counseling duties do not include any test administrations, serving as a testing coordinator, or providing any assistance with any assessment. So Most even the ACTs and SATs. Now, our counselors can do data disaggregation. They can work with students looking at the, their students' data, so they can help them with graduation plans and things like that. But they can't really serve as an assessment coordinator or anything they like are. that at your school. That's what they're doing. They're creating um, new CASB positions. will update their policy, and then one thing you need to keep in mind well, is you need to update job descriptions for your counselors to reflect the percentage of the work time that they will be uh, performing counseling duties. Uh, this is the year to plan. 2021-22 is a planning year to move into really the actual implementation of that in 22-23. There is a waiver um, if you don't have staff that uh, we haven't seen yet, but it, it will also be there. So I don't know why they're doing that. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Troy. Treat it nicely so it works. All right, thank y'all once again. And I know some of y'all are are asking we have a small we have a small group what we do so we have i think 90 something on zoom so just a chance and opportunity for people to get this uh get remotely um, i'm going to go through mine quickly because i mean we have the lawyers here and they've got some real good stuff for us so under instruction i'm going to go through this one relatively quickly uh, this is house bill 4545 and this is a big there's a lot of stuff in this uh, the superintendents will be definitely working on that. I'm going to kind of get the general overview on uh, 45, 45, and then surely make sure I get this right as well. <laughs> uh, so, if you have some students that failed their star test, um, this last test, which is in the spring, House Bill 45, 45 now requires the school to give them 30 hours of remediation per subject that they fill. So if they have four tests that they fill, they have to get 120 hours of additional remediation above and beyond. It can't be uh, pullouts from classes. It has to be above and beyond. So this put a lot of pressure on the school. Also, the requirement is if you have to have a three to one ratio, three students to one teacher. Well, well, that's going to be tough, uh, but you can also get a parent waiver, and if a parent waives that, you can have larger, but you have to have documentation. You can have larger groups, but you have to have a documentation parent. with the parents allowing the school to have a greater than a three to one ratio. Greater than one to three ratio. So, um, oh, the ratio. Okay, I'm sorry. What else? Yeah. That's the toughest. Okay. So when you hear them talking about some tutoring. Uh, some remediation they're going to have to get really creative i don't know if that's extending the school day i don't know if that's 
uh, every school's going to have their their plan, and it's it's a lot of work, uh, and so it's it's going to be it's going to be challenging. Yes, sir. What happens if the student refuses? I don't. If the student, the question was, what happens if the student refuses to take it? Um, I do. I think they're retained. They're retained. I think that's so I, I I really honestly don't know. Sure, do you? So that the recovery and learning committee serves as the group that tries to figure out how to work with the students. So there are lots of options. You can use summer school, you can use summer school. There, there are some different options. You could have used this summer school if it met all the criteria for House Bill 4545. And some of that is just getting some parents to sign some waivers because we usually have more than a one to three ratio. And then you can do things through the year and in the summer. So um, I do believe uh, Dane is correct that if they don't get the acceleration, of course we're going to retest and they would be continuing to take remediation until they pass that assessment. But we would be giving, like at the end of course, at the high school level, you keep giving that a retake. And as soon as they pass that, then this uh, remediation goes away. So you can do night school, you can do tutoring after school. All right, thank you. And the other thing about that is, if a that. student was remote um, last year, they were remote and they didn't take the test, the state says you have to assume that they are 30 hours per week. If they to start this, you have to start your remediation on the student or get them an approved uh, test before the year starts to make sure that they are on track. So this is big. This, was huge. this is a lot of work uh, for the school to make sure that they're meeting this and uh, get their teachers. And this, this, is, this one is going to be a challenge. I don't understand what the problem Next is Senate Bill 1697. This is the parental option for student retention. Basically on this, and I'm not going to read this so you can see it, but basically because of COVID, uh, you can ask, you can ask, or the parent has the right to ask for their kids to be retained. You can look at pre-K, you can look at kindergarten, first and third, and fourth through eight. Uh, so I won't read that to you, but basically the parent has the right to to request for their attention again. I guess for that they already have that anyway, but there you go, it's a law. Um, on school finance, I'm gonna go through this quickly and then I'll be finished. House Bill 1525 is a, another monstrous bill and this is known as the House Bill 3 cleanup. If you remember House Bill 3 was a huge funding uh, bill, the last legislative session in 86, well, there were some unintended consequences that happened when, and some of them were CTE, get in the town a lot of it, so there were some mistakes that messed up some school as far as funding. So the commissioner came back and he corrected them. They gave him the right to go and correct those specific schools that had issues. They turned around and passed 1525, which is supposed to clean it up. And you can see the CTE funding was changed, the, the gifted and talent allotment, the fast growth allotment, the formula, those formulas were changed to uh, to get it corrected. Uh, Comp Ed um, was, was, current, uh, was changed, which is some of the homeless. Some of the other things in there to look at, they created new grant programs for schools, so there's a whole list of grants that are available. Uh, you can see that they uh, they have an open meeting act is now a requirement for your shack meeting. So your shack now has to follow the open meeting, post the post the um, uh, agendas. That's another big one. Uh, it kept schools from swapping that you that you this you know, So they made that illegal. Uh, some schools were uh, some schools were taking their eyes, uh, lowering their M and O and raising their eyes. Student health activities. You might have to make sure I'm not lying on this, but uh, diet, did not exercise. <laughs> 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 now, it's a committee. You can take your diet, that's your instructional materials a lot. So that's the money that the school gets for curriculum. You can now use it for distance learning. And that's those are just some of the highlights for 
House Bill 1525. This is a huge, huge bill. And if you want to get into the nuts and bolts of the allotments and how they switch the, the funding, I just recommend you research that. This one, this one is a good one. So if you all have any questions on the 4545 and especially this House Bill 1525. Parents can opt out and it's compulsory. So for House Bill 4525, there isn't a parent opt out and compulsory attendance of loss. Okay. So they're going to have to. They're going to have to. All right. Um, any other questions? Vermont. Special ed. Okay. Appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, so. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Janet Bubert, and I'm with the Underwood Law Firm, and we are thrilled to be here with you all this evening to share all the fun new challenges that the legislature um, provided for you guys this year. I am going to be covering two topics this evening. I'm going to go through some of the new legislation that was passed related to your special education programs. And then I'm also gonna be talking about personnel issues. So jumping right into special education, um, we always see some activity in this area. And I will tell you that um, a lot of what we saw this year continues to be motivated by an advocacy agenda that has been pushed by Disability Rights of Texas for going on 10 plus years. Um, they are an organization throughout the state that represents parents and students uh, with disabilities. And for a long time, they have had made a concerted effort to try to limit the use of certain types of behavior interventions in schools. They have been highly concerned about the use of restraint and timeout at, in public schools. And we continue to see um, an evolution of the legislation and the statutes in this area as a result of some of their efforts. And this session was no different. We do have some new provisions related to those students in our special education programs that have behavior intervention plans. If a student has a behavior intervention plan, the law now states that that plan must be reviewed at least once a year. Now that shouldn't be a surprise and that should not be a new practice because those students were already required to have a review of their IEP, their individualized education program. Those IEPs have already been reviewed once a year. So this is just putting it, codifying that practice that you're already doing as a requirement of federal law, but now we also have the requirement mirrored under state law, but with a little bit extra because the federal law already required an annual review of the student's um, program, which would include any behavior interventions that you had included. But now the law recognizes that it may be necessary to go back more than once a year to review those plans. And so in addition to the annual review, there's now an obligation to consider changes to a behavior and intervention plan if any of those circumstances occur. If we have a change in placement, we start to see an increase in disciplinary actions, pattern of unexcused absences, or if we start to see elopement, if we start seeing running out of the classroom, running off of the campus, um, any unauthorized departures from the educational setting, or when the student's behavior becomes a safety issue, um, either for themselves or for other students. And so in any of those cases, we're gonna wanna go back um, to the ARD committee, which is the, is the school committee that includes the parent, that reviews and develops those plans. Also related to those students that have behavior plans, um, there's now an expectation that within 10 days of a disciplinary action that results in a change in placement, so anytime we're removing a student with a disability from their regular educational setting and putting them into a disciplinary setting, then there's an obligation for the district to seek parent consent to conduct an FBA, a functional behavioral assessment. And that again loops back to the idea that if we are seeing behavior that causes a removal from the classroom, then perhaps the behavior interventions that we're using with that student are not effective. And so we need to be collecting additional data and we need to be reviewing those plans and seeing if we need to revise them and or improve them. 
If a student with a behavior plan um, is put into timeout, if timeout is used as any type of behavior intervention with a student that has a behavior plan or BIP, as we refer to them, then there's now a documentation requirement. In addition to being very concerned about the use of timeout and restraint in the school setting, another um, agenda item and focus of the advocacy efforts of Disability Rights Texas and other parent advocacy groups is that they are concerned that parents don't receive enough information. Of course, in a perfect world, we would love to have the time and resources to sit down with parents and review their students' behavior, review their students' progress on a very regular basis. But this is very much a balance of time and resources for school districts. And so we're constantly have that tension of how much information is it necessary and appropriate to share with parents. Well, those documentation requirements have now increased as a result of this new statute that's going to require documentation anytime you use timeout if it's related to behavior that is documented in a behavior plan. On the restraint side, we've also increased the documentation requirements. We already have TEA rules that require a school district to anytime they use restraint with a student there's an expectation the school would use their best efforts to provide the parent with verbal notice that the restraint has occurred within the same school day. And then we'll, well, you're required to provide written notice to the parent within one school day. So the expectation of there being follow-up and notice to a parent after you've had an incident that involves restraint already exists in our TEA rules. We've now escalated that to a statutory requirement and we've added to the information that has to be provided to the parent. So previously they were required to receive um, all of the information in the first few bullet points. What's new and different is that if, going back to those behavior plans again, you see a lot of focus on the development of those behavior plans and the use of those behavior plans um, in this case, if you have an incident involving restraint then you, and the student has a behavior intervention plan, you're required to provide the parent notice about whether or not there's a need to reconsider and perhaps revise that behavior plan. If the student does not already have a behavior plan, but now they've engaged in conduct that resulted in restraint, then that notice has to inform the parent about how they can request an ARD meeting to discuss the possibility of conducting that FBA, that functional behavioral assessment. Looking to provide more information for the school, more evaluation data that they can rely upon to maybe revisit and reconsider the types of interventions that they're using. Right now we have one student uh, there's also now a requirement that all of this behavior documentation that we've been talking about related to the use of timeout and related to the use of restraints, that now there is an expectation that that information will be retained in the student special education eligibility folder. And this stems from a concern that when those ARD committee meetings occur and the ARD committee is reviewing the student's education plan, that they're not always getting access to all of the relevant information about behavior that may have accumulated during the school year. And so this is intended to make sure that when those ARD committees are making decisions about future years and future plans for these students, that they have um, all the information that might be necessary and appropriate for them to consider to make sure that we're addressing those behavior needs appropriately. Okay. This um, Senate Bill 89 uh, is known as the COVID Special Education Recovery Act. And this was an attempt by the legislature to ensure that students with disabilities um, are being considered for possibility of additional recovery services or compensatory services as a result of any negative impacts that may have occurred following COVID-19 and following any periods of remote instruction. 
It's not a surprise to anyone that those students with disabilities were impacted to a greater degree for a lot of them uh, because they just could not adapt to the virtual instruction or some of those related services that were part of their plan. It may have been difficult for the district to provide those services. Um, during the period of school closure or during any periods where it was primarily remote instruction being provided. And so a lot of districts, most districts during this past school year, during the 2021 school year, were already considering these issues as the students, with, as all students were coming back to campus. We were looking at what are their special needs, where are the gaps that we need to make up and so there's generally been across the board a consideration of whether or not students maybe needed some additional support, some additional help to make up for any um, limitations on progress resulting from uh, the impact of COVID-19. This is just codifying that to make sure that no one slips through the cracks. And so this applies to those students who are a part of your special education program. If the student was enrolled in your SPED program, during the 1920 or 2021 school years, then during this upcoming school year, during the 21-22 school year, there's an obligation to develop an IEP supplement. And again, the IEP is the individualized education program that we develop for a student with a disability. And that IEP supplement needs to review these certain inquiries. Number one, that you're going to look at whether or not the student was due for an evaluation, whether that was an initial evaluation or a reevaluation, that you're going to consider whether there was a delay in conducting that evaluation because of COVID-19. If you had a student coming into the program during those school years and you had to develop an initial IEP for that student, then we're looking at whether or not there was any delay in developing that initial IEP, perhaps as the result of a delay in the evaluation or some other delay in um, the availability of services. And you're going to consider whether the special education services were interrupted, reduced, delayed at any point during the 1920 or 2021 school year. And once you've gathered that data and documented that data into the student's IEP supplement, whether or not the evaluation was delayed, whether or not the initial IEP development was delayed, and whether or not there were any changes or interruptions to services, then you're going to consider whether or not there's a need to provide compensatory education as a result of those, of those inquiries and those factors. This IEP supplement is not about pointing fingers at districts for having late evaluations. Not that that's not going to also occur, but that's going to occur separately under a different program. This is really looking at the student and making sure that the district has documented for each student with a disability these considerations and whether or not there's a need to provide additional services as a result. Now there is a caveat to this Recovery Act that if during the 2021 school year, if you were super efficient and super ahead of the game during 2021, and you have already incorporated into the student's IEP from last year, all of these considerations, and you went through and documented that in their IEP, and you've already considered and documented whether or not the student required additional services, then you're not required to complete the supplement during the next coming school year. Um, but we are cautioning folks not to overly rely on this opt-out provision because the, the inquiries are so specific and you need to make sure that you've hit on documenting all four of those um, required inquiries before you rely on your 2021 documentation. Districts have until May of 2022 to complete the IEP supplements. Uh, which should not be an issue because we're reviewing those IEPs annually anyway. And so at some point during this coming school year, that student should be up for it for an annual review. This um, deadline for filing a due process complaint, House Bill 1252, this is one that we have been expecting for several sessions. It has been proposed previously multiple times and didn't pass. This time it did pass. 
This relates to the deadline for a parent to file a request for a due process hearing with TEA to challenge their child's special education program or the identification of their student as a student with a disability. Um, under federal law, federal law states that a parent has two years to file a complaint and request a hearing. And so that has been the standard at the federal level for some time. And most states um, in the U.S. follow that two-year limitations period. But the federal law also allowed individual states to adopt their own different timeline. And Texas adopted a one-year timeline. So this whole time, we have only allowed parents to go back one year when they're filing a complaint requesting a due process hearing. If you have the benefit of your district not being identified in a due process hearing and it is not something that you're familiar with, good for you. Um, but due process hearings are basically, it's, a, it's an adversarial administrative hearing in front of a TEA independent hearing officer. Because of the way Texas has adopted rules for due process hearings, there are basically many trials. And so it is a very time intensive and expensive process for school districts. Um, and the downside, the significant downside of expanding the limitations period from one year to two years, which is what this new statute does. This new statute says no state can lessen the time period for a parent to file a complaint. So our one year time period just got expanded to two years. One significant impact on districts is we believe it's likely to make these hearings more expensive because if you can go back two years, you're likely going to broaden the scope of issues that a parent can identify in their complaint. So we think there's a very real possibility that these are going to become more expensive for districts the other concern is that if a parent can go back two years, that that puts a lot more pressure on districts with regards to your document retention practices. Because when we have to go to a due process hearing and we're trying to convince a due process hearing officer that the school district did everything right and that there were no violations of the federal or state laws related to the implementation of the student's special education program, the more documentation we have, the better. And so if it is your practice to discard a lot of the supporting documentation that are collected by teachers throughout the year to in order to show how much progress a student made, um, then you may wanna reconsider whether there's a need to, to look at those um, retention policies and retention practices, because we'll be, have to defend any decision that the school makes with regard to a student's a special education program or the implementation of that program or the evaluation of that student, we'll have to be able to defend all those decisions going back two years. Okay, other new legislation um, related that kind of indirectly impacts our special education programs. UIL sports program and is now going to be required, UIL is going to be required to develop an inclusive UIL sports program. The uh, expectation is that this is going to focus particularly on students with intellectual disabilities um, who may be interested in participating in, in some kind of sporting activities. And so UIL is gonna be developing that for those, for those students. And it also, um, under SB 40, this is an acknowledgement of um, the success in a lot of areas with the use of telehealth services during the pandemic um, and during those periods of, of school closure and remote instruction. Uh, during the pandemic, we had a lot of um, emergency rulemaking or, or exceptions, I guess I should say, exemptions from current rules in order to allow for the use of telehealth services. A lot of these related to students with disabilities because we were providing teletherapy services um, remotely during that period. And for a lot of students, it was, it was a success and it was effective and it was useful. And so this is uh, codifying some of those things that were adopted during the pandemic 
to allow that practice to go forward. And in SB 40 specifically um, mentions and talks about the use of telehealth services for students in public education or in private education programs. So we're hoping that um, that will help provide some more opportunities for a lot of districts because especially in rural areas, it can sometimes be difficult to, to get the services that you need for students. And so hopefully maybe this opens up some additional opportunities. Okay. Next, I'm gonna transition into some personnel issues. In the personnel area, you know, it's, it's not often that when we're doing legislative update following a legislative session, it's not often that the TRS group gets all the buzz. So those are usually not the most interesting or exciting bills to talk about. Um, but I think this year, uh, TRS gave everyone a run for their money because a lot of what we're hearing about, a lot of what we're talking to districts about, comes out of some of the new legislation related to TRS. First is the Senate Bill 1444, which provides the option for school districts to opt out of TRS active care. Uh, this is something that TRS has been monitoring for a while. There was already a, a prohibition of if you offer, if you participate in TRS active care, then there a, was a prohibition on offering any alternative um, programs to, to your employees. But what districts did was they opted out of that statute through their districts of innovation plan. And so TRS saw several districts using the DOI plans to be able to offer TRS active care as well as other alternative coverage plans. This was creating problems for TRS because it gave them a very it gave them a lack of certainty with regards to what their enrollment was going to look like and how many folks they were actually going to have to cover from year to year. And so um, the the bill um, sponsors for this actually worked very closely with TRS, and it's our understanding that this um, statute that they came up with incorporates a lot of the concerns and addresses a lot of the concerns that TRS had. So. So you now can choose as an entity, as a school district, to opt out of participation in TRS active care. If you're going to opt out, then you have to provide notice to TRS by December 31st prior to the plan year that you intend to opt out. So if you wanted to opt out, it's too late to opt out for this year, but if you wanted to opt out for 22-23, you would need to provide notice no later than December 3rd. December 31st of 2021. To create that certainty that TRS was looking for, if you opt out, you are opting out for at least five years. You have to make a five-year commitment to the opt-out. And so you will not be able to re-enroll in TRS active care for at least five plan years. If you have opted out and you are out for five years and then you want to come back, when you re-enroll, you're going to have to commit to staying in for five years. Um, and so that provides them more certainty with regards to what they can expect with regards to um, plan participants. It also eliminated the option for school districts to exempt themselves from that prohibition on offering alternative programs or coverage programs through the District of Innovation plans. So that practice that has been going on for a few years is now going to be eliminated. So it's going to be an all or nothing situation. Districts are going to have to decide if they want to go active care or if they want to go with an alternative plan. Um, we have talked to some folks that have expressed some concern with um, uh, other entity or other coverage plans that are seeing this as a huge opportunity to approach school districts and offer very competitive plans. The concern is that knowing that once you opt out, you are going to be out for five years, making sure that these plans that look great now are actually still gonna look good in year two, three, and four. 
Um, and so just something to consider if you are considering uh, shopping for a new coverage plan and making that making those decisions, you want to make sure that you um, understand what that's going to look like for the five years to come. Okay. This is the one we talked about. Another hire, hire. hot TRS bill with House Bill 202. Um, this is a very short bill with a very big impact. Uh, House Bill 202 basically eliminates the opportunity for a school district to pass on the surcharge that TRS requires when a school district hires a TRS retiree. So when an educator retires from school district or other educational entity and begins recovering uh, TRS benefits, their, their retirement benefits, at that point there are already a lot of restrictions in place that limit their ability to go back to work for a school district or another educational institution. Um, but regardless of whether they and not they meet the return to work requirements, anytime a school district hires a retiree, there's a surcharge that has been imposed by TRX. And that surcharge is fairly significant. And so it became common practice when the surcharges started 10 plus years ago, it became common practice for school districts to look for ways to pass that surcharge on to the retiree employee, the retiree hire. And there are a couple of ways that that, is, that, that has happened. Uh, one is that sometimes the districts would incorporate into their contracts an addendum or additional language that authorized the district to deduct from the retire, retiree hire's payroll whatever the amount of the surcharge is going to be. Because the surcharge has to be paid directly by the school district to TRS. It gets charged directly from TRS to the school district. And so to offset that charge, uh, they were deducting those amounts from the employee's paycheck. The other possibility that we've seen and, and option that a lot of districts have chosen is that when they're negotiating salaries with a retiree rehire, that they lower the salary from what they would have paid a non-retiree um, so that it offsets and makes up that difference. Um, in either case, now the statute specifically prohibits the direct, any direct or indirect efforts to pass on the cost of that surcharge to the employee, to the retiree. Sure. And so this is going for a lot of districts that have routinely relied upon being able to hire retirees without neg being negatively impacted financially. Uh, this is going to take away that opportunity. And so now it is always going to be more expensive if you're hiring a retiree. And that is Part of the point yeah, that was the Lady motivation Lady was to discourage um, districts from hiring retirees. I think that'll be at the school district. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But now we're going to pay it if we rehire. Oh, I was think. really hoping we were going to get out of here without that question. <laughs> no, it's a great question. So the question was, how does that impact what you already have in place now? Um, and it's, it, it is the first question that we always get because you entered into your contracts back in the spring of 2021 before this bill had been passed and before this was a new law. Um, we're encouraging folks to work with your legal counsel on that issue to the extent that it has been your practice to deduct from your payroll. We think that because that is such a direct um, opportunity or a direct act and that would be in violation of the law, that that's something that you would have to stop doing. And so you would no longer be allowed to make those deductions. The more difficult question is what about those districts that maybe entered into a contract where the contract amount, the salary amount was reduced in order to offset that surcharge. Um, there are some potential constitutional arguments 
that can be made. There's some constitutional issues that prohibit a legislature from adopting a law and in retroactively enforcing it in a way that negatively impacts a contracting position. And so we, there are some arguments out there that can be used to challenge whether or not you should be allowed to go ahead and rely upon your current contracts. Um, if you choose to do that, there is still also the potential for that to be challenged either by teachers, by the educator themselves, by TRS, um, as being an indirect way to pass that on. So if your practice is to do a deduction then um, our advice has been to stop that practice. <laughs> if you're re relying on a contract that just had a reduced salary, I think that's gonna require further consideration. Is that not a lawyerly way to not really answer the question? <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I mentioned already before that uh, retirees, once they uh, once they retire and begin collecting retirement benefits from TRS, uh, that there are a lot of limitations on the extent to which they can return to work for um, an educational, a public educational institution, and and if a retiree enters into employment with the school district in a way that is in violation of those return to work exceptions, then they have always risked their benefits being revoked. So any benefits that they were um, had, had obtained since their retirement were potentially forfeited for that period when they were working for the school district in an unlawful way or to an unlawful extent. A lot of those restric restrictions deal with how much time you um, are not working, what kind of a break you have in employment before going back to work for a school district, and then also whether or not you're working full-time or part-time. Um, and so this forfeiture, uh, this forfeiture restrictions uh, have always been in place and there was a concern that it was um, overly harsh towards the retirees uh, to stop their benefits without any kind of a warning and for them to have to forfeit those benefits without any kind of warning. And so this um, Senate Bill 288, and it actually shows up in some other new laws as well, but Senate Bill 288 as well as House Bill 1585 basically implemented what TRS is now calling the three strikes rule. And so if you are a retiree who unknowingly enters into employment with the school district, with yeah, school district, sorry, without a, an awareness or understanding of the impact that it's going to have on your retirement benefits, it gives you some warning before they before you are forfeiting those benefits. And it basically says that first the district has to provide you written a written notice warning that uh, I'm sorry, not the district, TRS. Once TRS gets a report of employment that they believe is in violation of the return to work laws, then TRS has to provide written notice and a warning to that employee, letting them know that their employment does violate the return to work rules and that they, uh, if they continue in that position, then they will be subject to forfeiting their retirement benefits. That's the first notice. The first notice is considered a warning. Then the second notice comes in any subsequent month after the first notice is provided. If the retiree continues to work in that position, then they receive a second notice from TRS. And the second notice again has to explain why TRS believes that their employment violates the return to work rules. And then it also needs to provide notice to the uh, retiree employee that they are going to owe to TRS either the amount of the retirement benefits that they have received in violation of the rules since receiving the first warning because they didn't act fast enough after the first warning or if they don't want to pay back the retirement benefits they've earned, they have to pay back any compensation that they've received from the school district 
to the extent that that compensation was for time that they were not allowed to work. So if they were working part time, if they were only allowed to work part time, but they were working full time, then they would owe back half of whatever compensation that they had received from the district. If those first two warning, first two strikes are not enough to get their attention, then in any third subsequent month, they will be subject to forfeiture of their retirement benefits. There is an exception to everything that I just said, um, because we do have some exceptions in the return to work rules for retirees. They are adding a new exception specifically geared towards the opportunity to use retired educators and bring them into districts to assist with some of the additional remediation efforts that you may have to provide to students as a result of COVID-19. And so if you are a retiree who is returning to work for a school district, you are not going to forfeit your benefits if you are performing duties specifically related to the mitigation of learning loss and your position is in addition to normal staffing levels. So this is not an opportunity to, to use those positions that we already have, but if you are bringing on new positions, adding staff specifically to address the mitigation um, learning loss, and as long as those positions are fully funded by monies that you are receiving through a COVID relief program, and the position ends by December 31st, 24, then not only does that retiree not forfeit their benefits regardless of how many hours that they're working, but the district is also relieved from those TRS surcharges. So it is an opportunity if, you, um, have, if you're using those federal funds to bring in some additional staff for that short time period for a couple of years, while you are trying to make up those losses from COVID, it is an opportunity to use that pool of retired educators without there being a negative, um, a negative offset or a negative impact um, on, on the school district financially. All right, House Bill 2519. Uh, this relates to teacher resignations and when they resign, um, if they try to leave the district and resign their contract um, at the wrong time. So it has been the law in the past that a teacher or educator could resign their contract with the school district penalty free as long as they did that at least 45 days before the first day of instruction. So it provided that time period from the time the contract was issued, sometime in the late spring, um, until some point in the summer, whenever, depending upon when your new school year is gonna start, there was that time period where a teacher could unilaterally say, I've changed my mind, I've gotten another job, I'm moving out of state, whatever the case may be, they could unilaterally resign that contract and resign their position without there being any negative impact on the employee. After that time period, after that, what we've always referred to as the penalty free resignation period, after that time period, if a teacher resigned their contract within 45 days of the first day of instruction, then the district had the option if they chose to pursue it, the board could file, the school board could file a complaint with SBEC um, complaining about the fact that the teacher had abandoned their contract. And um, in the event of the abandonment of a contract, there were pretty significant uh, sanctions, potential for significant sanctions, including the suspension or revocation of the teacher's certificate. And so it's always been a pretty high stakes risk if a teacher chose to resign their contract, resign their contract after that penalty free period. This statute limits the amount of time that during which the school district could pursue sanctions against the teacher and expands the time that educators have to make that unilateral decision to resign their contract. So previously it was 45 days, now it's only a 30 day period. So up to 30 days before the first day of instruction, a teacher can still can resign their contract without penalty from SBEC. 
if the teach if the district within the 30 days even though we've shortened the window if within that shorter window the district chooses to pursue sanctions against a teacher who has abandoned their contract within the 30 days they're required to provide notice to the teacher and the notice has to specifically identify the basis of the complaint how the teacher may contact SBECs, presumably so the teacher can try to defend their actions, his or her actions, and provide information about extenuating circumstances. And then also a reminder that that teacher needs to update their information with SBEC since they're no longer gonna be employed by the district. SBEC um, can impose, cannot impose sanctions for untimely resignation without first considering mitigating factors or alternatives to sanctions um, against the teacher certificate. So law more favorable to teachers, uh, giving them more time to make decisions about whether or not they want to resign their contract, um, and also requiring a higher level of scrutiny by SBEC before they are going to impose sanctions for the abandonment of a contract. Uh, there were some changes with regards to educator certification programs as uh, a new requirements for SBEC to incorporate into the certification programs for anyone obtaining um, an educator certification. These certification programs now are required to provide instruction about students with disabilities and the statute also incorporates a definition of student with disabilities into chapter 21 of the education code. Under chapter 21, student with disability would now mean any student who's receiving services in your special education program under the federal law, the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or any student receiving uh, services under a section 504 program. So both of those grouping of students are considered students with disabilities for purposes of chapter 21 and those are the student that that's the category or the pool of students that we're going to provide additional instruction about through the teacher certification programs the certification programs are also now going to be provide required to provide um, student or teachers information on training on dyslexia mental health substance abuse and youth suicide Again, areas that we've seen a lot of attention on in past years and a recognition that we need to be equipping our new teachers with the tools that they need to help identify these issues so that they can pass that along to the appropriate in information along to the appropriate individuals. Specifically with regards to the instruction and knowledge that needs to be incorporated into the certification programs for students with disabilities, it's now gonna require knowledge of each IDEA disability category, as well as information about the conditions that can support section 504 eligibility for these students. This is directly in response to the like continued efforts um, in Texas to increase our child find efforts with, when it comes to students with disabilities and making sure that we're identifying those students who need to be evaluated and considered for those um, programs within your school district. Um, I'm really hopeful that in addition to helping to support your child find programs, that it will also have the advantage of giving teachers better tools and more information about how to implement IEPs and special education programs for individual students. What we see a lot of times is that a general education teacher very often has students with disabilities in their classrooms and depending upon their own personal experiences or depending upon the educator program that they participated in, they may or may not have had any opportunities to really learn about what those disabilities look like in the classroom, how they impact the students and how they need to be working with those students differently in order okay. to um, make sure that those students have the best opportunity to be successful. And so th this new development will hopefully um, help, again, provide those new teachers some additional tools and put them in a better position when they're faced with um, educating students with disabilities in their classroom. 
It's also going to require um, a showing of competence in the use of pro proactive instructional planning techniques and in evidence-based inclusive instructional practices. Again, just in enhancing that differentiated instruction in the regular general ed classroom to serve students with students disabilities, disabilities, which is also going to be a benefit for all we'll of the other students that. in the classroom as well. Uh, in addition to incorporating this training into the teacher certification programs, the statute also creates the expectation that to the greatest extent possible, this training will also be provided to current educators through a district staff development programs and opportunities. Um, other SBEC legislation, uh, minimum teacher certification requirements are now going to include instruction on virtual learning. Um, hopefully that is not something that will be required anytime soon again, but in the event that we do have to pivot back to remote learning or if your district, if you ever have the opportunity to provide virtual instruction if the legislature ever creates that opportunity, um, then those teachers have that basis and have, that to, have those tools to be more effective in the virtual environment. So and we've added a bilingual this, this special education this certification this is something to, to the also. list. Uh, fine, let's see, just a couple more on personnel. Um, they made some changes to the legal standard for your responsibility to report abuse and neglect of a child. Um, we know that everyone has the obligation under the family code to report if you suspect abuse um, or neglect of a child. Licensed professionals have a heightened responsibility to report, make a report if you suspect abuse or neglect within 48 hours. The standard, the language of the standard under the family code has now been changed to if you have reasonable cause to believe that abuse or neglect has occurred. And so under that standard, and we will have to wait for some, some litigation to get a better understanding of what that means. But if you had a reasonable cause to believe that abuse or neglect occurred rather than just a suspicion, then um, that is going to trigger that duty, duty to report. They made a change to the definition of sexual contact, from that sexual contact for the purposes of the statute that prohibits improper relationships with a student. Um, that definition of sexual contact has now been expanded to include more types of sexual touching and more um, circumstances under which sexual touching would be considered a violation of and would be considered an improper relationship that would be in violation of the Texas Penal Code. If you have an employee who has been accused of activity that would constitute an improper relationship, this statute also puts some limitations on the release of that employee's name unless it results in an indictment. So you should not be releasing that name to the public or to media, they are the public, um, should not be releasing that information unless you have a situation where the individual has been indicted. There are exceptions. You can release the name to the extent that it's necessary to do so for you to conduct your own investigation once there has been an allegation, or if you have an obligation, and you do, to make a report to an outside agency, which would include TEA, law enforcement, or any other reporting agency. If there is a reporting requirement, then you can comply with that requirement without violating the statute. You can also, in certain circumstances, release the identity of the um, alleged individual or the individual alleged to have committed an improper relationship to school members or in the school community in accordance with district policy and procedure. So want to make sure that you're comfortable and understand what those limitations might be, either in current policy or in a future policy that you would adopt before you're sharing information about allegations related to an improper relationship. And finally, 
No public money under Senate Bill 282. No public money may be used to pay a settlement related to a sexual harassment claim made against a member of a governing body of a political subdivision. So that would be school board trustees. School districts are political subdivisions for the purpose of the statute. So school board members, as well as, and it's not on the slides, so you might want to jot it in, as well as school district employees or officers. So any allegations of sexual harassment against board members, school employees, school officers, you cannot enter into a settlement agreement using public funds um, to settle those disputes or to settle those allegations. And similarly, the Texas legislature is not just political subdivisions. Same rules apply for the Texas legislature as well. So with that, I am going to pass the baton to Fred Stormer, who I know many of you already know. Oh, yes. Oh, Fred, we know Fred. He's on our Christmas list. We should be on his Christmas list. You guys hear me? On the Bart Brooks headset? Can you hear me now? Better? Okay, let's try this out. Okay. All right. I was kidding about the margarita last night, but now I may be changing my mind again. Let's talk about contracts, right? How fun is that? They saved the best for last. All the exciting topics I get to have. Namely, have, have you ever gotten the feeling that there's a group of people talking to you? They're all in a circle and you're on the outside of the circle and you're wondering what they're saying and you know it can't be good? That's kind of my perception of the legislature this session when it comes to uh, contracts, particularly construction contracts with school districts. There were a number of bills that passed that um, really weakened the school district's bargaining power when it comes to negotiating construction contracts with both the architects and with your contractors. And so the first one I want to talk about, because there's an overall effort of number one um, to, to leveling the playing field that architects and contractors felt was against them uh, in negotiating school district contracts. Uh, and also to increase the transparency when it comes to the process of awarding those contracts. So I think it's gonna get a little more difficult in the coming year uh, to not only uh, bid for construction projects, but also negotiate those contracts. So the first thing we wanna talk about is what's called the login rule versus the spearing doctrine. And so I won't bore you too much, but in 1907, the Supreme Court issued a decision in this law longer than case um, that provides that contractors, if the contract is silent, will bear the risk of liability for design defects. So even if you present them with plans and, and specifications for a building that were wrong and incorrect and defective, the contractor had a duty to make sure he built a proper building. And that was very good for owners. And we liked that. Now contractors typically try to negotiate that liability and that exposure out of the contract, and we worked hard to make sure the monitoring rule still apply. Most of the country follows what's called the sparing doctrine, and that's where the owner basically impliedly, impliedly warrants that when they provide plans and specifications that they are going to be without defects, and it relieves the contractor of that liability to provide a, a proper building. Um, Texas has now removed the Lauderdale Doctrine um, and, and we now follow the Sparing Doctrine. And we cannot contract out of that anymore. So that allocation of risk that we normally put on the contractor as well as an architect to make sure we got proper facilities is now eliminated. We can't do that anymore. However, the contractor still has a duty to disclose defects that it knows or reasonably should know. Okay, so if the contractor is aware of a defect in plans or specifications from the architect, they are under an obligation to let us know so that can be corrected. If they knowingly fail to do this, just knowingly build something that isn't proper, 
then they can be liable for those damages just like they were under the old law. Uh, another thing that is in, in this bill, Senate Bill 219, and another bill we'll talk about later, is it reduce the standard of care for architects. Used to be under some certifications under provision in the administrative code, architects uh, had to be held to the highest standard of care. Pretty good for us. It doesn't seem unreasonable. They ought to be held to the highest standard of care. Now, under the new law, the, comp the architect only has to be good as a competent architect in your area. Okay? He just has to be good enough. So, the other change that I think uh, could impact school districts. I mean, we're building school facilities, new schools, stadiums, um, facilities and buildings that a potential defect could take a long time to discover. Okay, so school districts and constructions have what's called a statute of repose that lasted for 10 years. For 10 years after substantial completion, if there was a defect in your building, the way it was designed or the way it was constructed, a school district could make a claim. Okay, normal statute of limitations for other people are four years. Under contract law, we had 10. And if we made a claim against an architect or a contractor within that 10 year period, that statute of repose would get extended to 12 years. So basically, we had 12 years from the date of substantial completion to file a lawsuit. In this last legislative session with HB 3069, it's now been reduced to eight. And I think that is just a trend. If I were to guess on the next legislative session, it may go down to six. Okay? Uh, and again, nothing we can do to contract around that. Uh, we just lost two years uh, out of the potential ability to file a lawsuit. And you think, well, eight years is still pretty long. Think about um, problems with concrete and foundations and walls that may not be discovered until very late in the process. Uh, anybody remember the controversy with Alice Football Stadium a few years ago? That could have gone a completely other direction. And so the architects and the contractors have had a very strong lobby, uh, and they are being very effective with the legislature. Okay. Uh, evaluation criteria for awarding construction projects, HB 2581. Okay. Uh, a lot of administrators have heard me rant on about the process that you need to follow bid requirements and, and uh, make sure you put criteria and weights and scoring. It's all become a lot tougher. Uh, again, contractors, architects want to increase transparency. They want to make sure that the bid laws are not only applied, but they are applied fairly. Uh, and so two ways they do that is holding us more accountable to how we're going to score and evaluate bidders or proposers on our construction contracts. Um, and they're also going to make us accountable for making our records on how we evaluate those people more, more transparent because an offer an offer or one of the press documents related to the evaluation of responses uh, after a contract is awarded, and we must deliver documents no later than 30 days after the request. Okay. Also, for competitive seal, uh, proposals, districts must make evaluations public and provide them to all the offerors, anybody who responded to your RFP or your competitive seal proposal, no later than seven business days after the contract is awarded. So some of you who have worked with me on this, if you'd like to send you a little scoring matrix, you know, with criteria and weights and forms and how you evaluate all your proposers, all that is going to become public information after seven days. Now, does that mean that they have to request it from you and you give it to them, or does it mean that we automatically just send it out to all our proposals? I think it means the latter, and we're going to have a hard time meeting that obligation. It's just one of those things that we all need to be aware of and get our ducks in order as we look forward to our construction projects and what our obligations are. This is the other bill I was referring to in 2016 with regards to architect and engineer agreements. Again, what we've seen just through this last couple of sessions, particularly this session, is that the legislature is, is legislating our ability to make contracts with our architects and with our contractors. And so again, 
And what we're able to do just is continually narrow and shift away a little bit. So one of the things we always like to put in our contracts is giving to defend provisions. Uh, that if we are sued because of some negligence and error or omission by an architect, uh, that they have an obligation to defend us. Uh, that is prohibited now. Uh, it severely lessens that. What we are left is left with is having the contracts provide that we are named as additional insureds under the architect's error and emissions uh, insurance coverage. And, and that will give us some protection, but it's also going to increase our costs. So just know that's coming down the line as well. Uh, our fees for architects and engineers are going to get higher. And likewise, this uh, bill talks about the same standard of care that is now reduced. Um, that it has to be that of a competent architect. It can no longer be held to a higher standard of care than that. And if we try to put it in a contract, that provision will be void and unenforceable. Again, these provisions to construction contact contracts usually take effect after September 1 of this year. So if we nod and they're signed now, we're good. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have to start making these changes. Senate Bill 13. Remember back in 2019, we had a couple of new verification provisions that we were all required to put in our contracts if they reached certain amounts, maybe it's 2017. All the provisions with regard to no boycotting, uh, no doing business with vendors that boycotted Israel. Okay, that was one of the verifications we had include, include the other one was we can't do business with anybody who does business with a terrorist organization. Uh, they liked that so much, we have now incorporated that, and now we can't, we have to have a verification that our vendor does not boycott an energy company. Now, it's not quite as restrictive as the first was. This applies to companies that have 10 or more employees. It doesn't apply to sole proprietorships, and the contract must be valued at $100,000 or more. But again, if you look at contracts that we prepare, we have a whole list of verifications and certifications that are required. If we're using federal funds, there's even more. We're going to add this one to it. And we're also going to add a provision about no discrimination uh, of firearm entities. Anybody who sells guns or ammunitions, we are not allowed to boycott them, boycott them as well. And we're going to have to have verification in our contracts as well that we cannot discriminate against firearms or ammunition companies. The same limitations apply. Um, where this is really going to come, I think impact is probably not so much uh, in your contracts. I don't see too big of a problem of anybody being in business with boycotting energy companies or discriminating against firearm companies or the firearm industry. But in our investments, what you do uh, with your school money and, and what you invest in could be limited and those things may be changing. Okay, that's contracts. Any questions? It's fun stuff. Okay, school state. Um, again, I, I think there was at least some acknowledgement by the legislature this session that we need to have some higher concern uh, about um, students' emotional well-being. Um, we've seen a trend of uh, child suicides. Uh, a lot of allegations that those are arising from bullying. Uh, one of the things that I think is going to be implemented is now school IDs for anybody who's in sixth grade or higher has to have a hotline for the National Suicide uh, Hotline. Um, and you can also provide the number for your local suicide prevention hotline if one's available to you. Uh, so we've got to print those on cards and I did a little homework for you, and we put the one eight hundred number on it. The school marshal bill, Senate, Senate Bill seven forty one. Again, this applies beginning with the 21-21 school year. Uh, we don't use a lot of the school marshals in our area, but they are more widely used, uh, and it provides um, some abilities there and a little more flexibility. Before school marshals could not conceal carry, now they can. There was a requirement that if they were still, that uh, they had to keep their firearm within arm's reach if they were interacting regularly with students. Now it's been expanded 
you can adopt some internal administrative regulations that would allow your school, school marshal, if you have one, to conceal carry. Plus, they can store their firearm uh, in a locked and secured safe or other locked location. So a little bit more flexibility there. Um, active school shooter drills. This one's kind of interesting. Uh, I think after the concern of what happened um, a few years ago, uh, we were called the school shooting down around Houston. Uh, we all did some hiking school drills. Um, and we had a large variety of how those drills were conducted. Uh, and we are now trying to regulate that some. Uh, this bill provides some authority uh, for the commissioner to develop best practices for active shooter drills in, in consultation with the school safety center. One of the requirements that we know, even though we don't have those best practices out yet, is the bill provides that everyone's got to know. Think about this and all the controversy that happens when we have a bunch of kids running out uh, into out of the school and scattering uh, when they're doing an active shooter drill and the first responders don't know about it, parents don't know about it, uh, it can create quite a bit of controversy. So now everyone has to be put on notice. Also, the drills have to be age appropriate. Uh, again, hopefully we get those best practices um, from the Commissioner of Education. They should be developed by professionals to be age appropriate. Also, something new, they're going to start collecting data as to the impact that these drills have on students. I don't know what that is going to look like, but it will be some other report that you guys are going to have to file and enter into TEA. Immunity of certain security personnel. Um, this answered a lot of questions that we had. Remember when, uh, when the Guardian programs first started being implemented, we had some real concerns about what is the school district's liability? What's the liability going to be for those persons that we authorize to carry firearms if we have an active shooter situation? This helps out and provides some immunity both for school districts and security personnel. But I don't think it quite answers everything that we want. Specifically, security personnel includes district peace officers, school marshals, resource officers, and retired police officers. Okay? Those people will be immune uh, in those active shooter situations. And we know the school district will now be immune uh, if there's any personal injury or property damage from a person who is authorized to carry under your school guardian program. What I don't know, and it's still a question, is does that teacher or administrator who is carrying a firearm under the Guardian program is going to be immune? Okay? It's not defined as one of those security personnel, even though they are acting in security capacity. Um, so that's not uh, completely clear right now, uh, and it's just something to consider. Okay. So if you didn't think contracts was fun enough, let's talk about taxes, <laughs> right? So again, transparency is a thing that has been consistent throughout the last several legislative sessions, um, particularly when it comes to contracting and also with regards to property taxes. Uh, 2019 was a big year uh, for uh, property tax reformation and they've continued on that thing because now the Texas Department of Information Resources has to create a website, a link, um, that directs people to their appraisal district. And so they have access to all their information regarding their property taxes, including the proposed tax rate and a schedule of public hearings for all the taxing entities where they reside. Okay? Uh, now the law went into effect June 1st, but it's a little confusing because the DIR does not have that website up. And that becomes important because all those notices that you guys have been putting in your papers for your public hearings on your budget and your tax rate should have had that website posting. However, we get a pass until the first tax year following uh, the release of that website. Okay? So it's not on for this year. 
Uh, but next year, we're going to have to post this information. Hopefully, the comptroller um, updates to public notice forms that you guys typically use, and it will be in there automatically. But we got to make sure it's there. Let's talk about elections. Okay. 2019, remember, if you are convicted of a felony, you are no longer eligible to be a school board trustee. Apparently, just saying it was not enough. Now, the application to be a candidate must check a box that you are not a convicted felon, and if you are a felon, that you have been pardoned. If you are a felon and you have been pardoned, get ready to provide proof that you are eligible and have been pardoned. I don't think that is a problem for too many people, at least no trustees that I know of, and I think that's a good thing. But remember, if you are a convicted felon and you lie about being pardoned, you will have committed a Class B misdemeanor if you did not know anything. That's scary. So, back to elections, well, internet posting of results. Where, do these, where does this stuff come from? And we're back to our theme of transparency. Um, I work a lot of elections with a lot of county clerks and voter registrars. And I'm just telling you, those people work pretty hard and they take their job very seriously. Um, and despite that, I think they're going to have to do a lot of extra work to increase that transparency, as well as school districts have now got some additional duties and obligations. Because now, if you have a website, and raise your hand if you don't have a website, okay, I think this applies to everybody. You now have to post all your election results on your website, and it can't be more than two clicks away from your home page. We can't bury our election results somewhere way four clicks away, I guess. Easily accessible. And so not only do we have to include the election results, we're also going to have the total number of votes, right? That doesn't seem unreasonable, but we want the total number of votes counted and uncounted on provisional ballots, okay? So Whoever's running your election now has some additional duties to count those. We also need the total number of votes for each candidate for and against each measure. That one seems pretty reasonable. But we need the total votes by personal appearance or uh, by mail during early voting. So there's another category. Who voted by personal appearance in early voting? Who voted by mail during early voting? And then we need the total votes by personal appearance on election day. Again, that is a pretty long and confusing list, uh, particularly if you're a school district that has elections in the hundreds rather than the thousands. Also, again, in this theme of transparency, you have some additional posting requirements for all your elections. Again, school districts, by statute, have to put notice in the paper no earlier than 30 days before the election, no later than uh, 10 days before the election. You have to post notice wherever you vote on your website and uh, any place that you post your agendas for your board meetings. But again, now you have a high notice requirement of not later than 21 days before the election to put the date of the election on your website, the location of each polling place, each candidate's name, and each measure that's going to appear on the ballot. Again, another obligation that we need to be sure of. I don't see this as being much of a problem for general trustee elections, even special trustee elections. Where this is going to have an impact is if someone tries to have what's called a voter, a voter approval tax rate election, that needs to be your rollback election, uh, or if you want to have a measure for a bond election. Again, one more thing, because if you don't do this notice, that becomes one more way for someone to challenge um, the validity of your election. Okay. Very important, hope everybody's listening. For those of you who follow your school finance uh, campaign information, if there are any, they can't do it by telegram anymore. There's a thing called the internet. I suggest you use that. Okay, random bills of interest. Charitable apples. Again, first thing I'm going to say, school districts are not charitable organizations that are eligible to conduct rallies. We don't want to be associated with them uh, in, in, to the extent that we're sponsoring them. We love to be the beneficiary of those for our um, 
organizations that are qualified to conduct uh, raffles. That's someone who is incorporated under the Texas Nonprofit Act and who has had 503C status for at least three years. Three years. Um, under the old law, they can only hold two raffles a year. Now they've had four raffles a year. And again, if the raffle occurs uh, in a school year, it doesn't matter if the prizes are awarded after that year. So if you're having your fourth raffle on New Year's Eve, December 31st, but you're not going to award the prize until January 2nd, that's okay. The other thing to remember, the maximum cap for values of prizes in a raffle used to be $50,000. It's now increased to seventy five. dollars that's not a big deal around too many raffles that I've seen, although I did hear about a school district that did something I thought was very clever. Instead, we can't raffle away money, because that's a lottery, right? We have to raffle, on, raffle away goods or services. But they were raffling away silver. I just thought that was a really smart idea. So if you're going to have a raffle, firearms are always good, and now you have silver as an option. <laughs> Just don't go check the daily price at the, uh, at the, what the value of that commodity is in the over $75,000. Okay. One of the big deals, operation of uh, transportation systems outside your school district. This has been prohibited under Chapter 34 for a long time. And it was widely ignored by school districts. We would go into another school district, pick up transfer students, and we all kind of did it, and it was all kind of okay until we got an attorney general decision back in 2017 and said you can't do that anymore unless you have an interlocal agreement with the other district to operate your transportation system within their boundaries. Okay? And a lot of districts did it. Some didn't do it. And that's okay. Hey, Sure what the commissioner did in order to get around that um, is they would offer a waiver. They would waive the provisions of 34.007, but you could not screen for grades, discipline, history, or attendance. All the things that we want to screen for, right? So what this session did is they said you can adopt a policy that you will accept transfer students as long as you don't screen for grades, discipline, history, or attendance, and you no longer need the commissioner's waiver. However, some districts still aren't good with that because what we want to do, we want to cherry pick as best we can, right? We want good students with good attendance that are going to be there. We also like to make sure they scored, what, 1,400 on an SAT, you know, maybe a 33 on an ACT, or we brought a 4 or 3 flat. But, we can't do those things. Um, so if you still want to uh, screen for grades, disciplinary history, and attendance, you can do that, but you have to have still that MOU with the other district. If you have that interlocal agreement and that memorandum of understanding, you're going to be okay. You can still screen for those things. If you don't and you have a policy, we need to make sure that policy about how you handle those transfers is posted on your internet website. I suspect just posting our normal academy policies online, like most of us do, is going to suffice for that. Liability protection for pandemic claims. Uh, this mostly applied to um, healthcare providers, but there was a couple of interesting parts that apply to school district and educational institutions. One of them is protection uh, from claims arising from modification of a grading policy, right? We all had to make some changes to our grading policies when we went virtual last year. How we calculated class ranks and those sort of things, what kids were getting as far as grades. Um, there was some controversy that arose out of that. I'm aware of a couple of instances. What we need to know is effective June 14 when this bill passed is the school district is going to be immune for those claims, uh, which is kind of nice to see. And again, we can all breathe a little easier because no matter what changes we make, even if we think we're doing what's in the best interest of the district, there's going to be some losers involved in that. There's going to be some people that it adversely affects, um, and it's just going to happen. But we are going to be protected in those situations. The other thing is we are immune from claims from individuals who have been exposed um, from uh, pandemic or exposure, you know, in COVID in our case. 
Um, uh, unless uh, the person knowingly failed to warn a remediated condition, I suppose if you knowingly had COVID and coughed on people, uh, that would be something that you could be responsible for. Or knowingly fail to implement comply with government safety standards, guidelines, or protocols. So if you if your local health authority says you need to quarantine and you don't quarantine, I think that could expose you to some liability. Other, other health or training on school safety. Um, again, one more training for trustees to complete. This one's going to have to be on school safety. Again, the State Board of Education in consultation with the Texas School Safety Center is supposed to develop that curriculum and those materials for that safety training. Um, nothing as of yet. More to come. We should know by January 1 of 2022. Our last slide. This is it. Um, allowing homeschooled students to participate in education. Uh, in extracurricular uh, programs and activities. This is not a requirement. This is a may, it's not a shall. And so a lot of you probably have already heard about this. You may have already had any subject to your board meeting, some proposals to allow homeschool kids to participate. That is optional. If you do allow it, they are still subject to the same policy requirements that your regular students are, okay? They have to be age eligible. If there are any fees for participation, those can still be charged. Uh, they have to provide, you know, uh, transportation, physical condition, all those qualifications are still going to apply, okay? And they have to reside within your district, uh, and they have to demonstrate academic proficiency, okay? That is required. Again, when it is the first six weeks that they are participating in this, they have to demonstrate grade level proficiency on a nationally recognized instrument. I don't know what that nationally recognized instrument is. I suspect your administrators know what that is. Uh, every six weeks after that, though, the grade verification that they are passing can be provided by the parents who is providing the home school. So, I guess that's a note from your mom saying Fred passed English and math uh, would suffice. And that's blackout. Look at that. I managed to finish 15 minutes early. You've never gotten that from me before. I know. So, if there's any questions, we're happy to answer them. If not, I think we get to be really early. Unless Troy's going to make you stay. I think we need to take 15 minutes on to it. All right, so that concludes our program. We really want to thank you for being here again. Just a reminder, uh, we did record this session. And so uh, if you have members that were not able to, to get this update, they want you to sign up and get that way. We'll go over and the watch it. I got you. <laughs> so we had like 98 registered, I think you're only looking at like 40 well, other reruns I want. <laughs> online. So if you are watching as a group and you need superintendents to have a sign-in sheet, send that sign-in sheet in to us so that we can make sure and give credit because all we can go by is the names we have listed in the, in the chat room. So anything else? You might have any questions or anything else? I'm just sorry. I can ask Fred a big question about liability for pandemic nights. Yeah. We're good. Thank you. We're good. Shut up. Yeah. Fred, we don't know more questions. All right. Okay. You ready, Darren? Very well. Well, should we go on? Yeah. I don't know if you need yeah. Uh, we did have some people signed up for open forum tonight, but we talked them out of it because their subject was not on the agenda. Who uh, was soccer. soccer. And per our district policy, uh, if in a special called meeting, if an item's not on the agenda, you do you can't you don't have to allow them to talk. They will probably be here for the uh, August twenty fourth meeting. I okay. ran into the whole herd of them in the lobby. They were, that's what they were talking about. You know, they're not going to talk about it until the 24th. We'll all come back and they all said, yeah, 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 that's what it means. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, with this two-hour training, we were going to have to shove them till eight when we got through, and they didn't want to hang around. So uh, that's just I've been reading some district policy, so that's how we are there. Uh, Mr. Morales wants to have an exec executive session, so the board will now convene in a closed meeting to discuss the following items posted on our agenda this evening as allowed by the Texas Government Code. Uh, we'll be talking about personnel as permitted by the code, personnel matters, government code 551.074. No voting will take place in closed session. Any action the board wishes to take as a result of discussions in closed session will take place after the board reconvenes in the open meeting. It is now 749. Okay, it is now 758. We will reconvene out of executive session. Uh, first item on the agenda, we have a resignation from a board member. I will read that now. This is dated August 5th of 2021. Uh, dear Joe Ogden, it is with regret that I am writing to inform you of my decision to resign my position on the Perryton Board of Education with the Perryton Independent School District, effective immediately. My nephew is being employed by the Perryton ISD, therefore following the nepotism requirements and restrictions I must resign my position from the board. <clears throat> I feel it's the best possible solution given this situation. It has been a pleasure being part of the Board of Education for Perryton ISD. I'm proud to have been part of the board for this short time and I have no doubt the board will continue to have success in the future. If I can be of any assistance during the time it will take to fill the position, please don't hesitate to ask. Best regards, Pete DeSantiago. So, uh, one of the actions of the board is tonight is we're going to appoint a trustee in Pete's position until the May election at this time. At that time, the, well, uh, his position will be open for the remainder of his term in the election. My recommendation, or, or we're going to appoint uh, Lloyd Cater into that position to fill until May. Any questions? If not, Lloyd, at this time, we will administer your oath. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess we need a motion to accept this appointment. Second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Five zero. Okay. All right, Lloyd. In the name and by the authority of the state of Texas, I say you I, Lord Cater, um, do solemnly swear <coughs> or affirm that I will faithfully execute the duties of the Office of Perryton ISD Board of Trustees in the state of Texas, and I will, to my best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States and of this state, so help me God. All right. You are duly sworn. Welcome again. You're welcome back. Okay. We've ministered the oath of office. Any other things to come before the board at this time? If not, I declare this meeting adjourned at 8.01.